My name is Brian Wish. I'm an entrepreneur, CEO, and Pathfinder. If I've learned anything in life, it's that self-discovery is a critical part of living intentionally, building meaningful relationships, and achieving the future we see for ourselves. In July of 2021, I sold all my possessions, headed west, and began a quest to live a fuller and more meaningful life. The experience helped me truly understand the power of a single moment. And through my conversations with leaders from all walks of life, I've seen how that one phone call, heartbreak, diagnosis, or lost job can transform the entire course of our lives. In this podcast, I sit down with entrepreneurs, influencers, and experts across industries to talk through the events that changed everything. Together, we'll relive the make or break decisions, hard conversations, periods of despair and hope, chance encounters, and everything that followed. N.T. Edo Atuk, better known by his nickname N.T., is the founder and CEO of FitGrid, the boutique fitness industry's first SaaS solution to fuel studio owners with the data and tools they need to strengthen instructor-client relationships, improve retention, and drive greater revenue. Over the course of his career, N.T. has founded multiple startups, including the educational video game developer Dimension U and the health and fitness-focused companies Your Guru and Boutique Fitness Solutions. NT was a model student and rarely found himself challenged at school. To try and branch out, NT took an electrical engineering course at Cornell and found himself frustrated with the course. This led to the realization that he could get by solely on his natural smarts, but still could do anything he put his mind to if he applied himself. NT, welcome to the One Away Show. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's great to be here with you today. Uh, it's been great getting to know you. So, NT, what is the one away moment that you want to share with us today? It's it's been, it's a series of moments that led to a big realization. When I was in high school, things came really easy. I I would do the studying and um, and it would work. Honestly, at the time, I was so convinced that. I wanted to convince myself that I was a genius and I thought that geniuses didn't work. Sometimes I'd work, sometimes I didn't. I'd get an A plus some semesters, another semester I'd get a B minus. I'm like, what is that? You know, I'd fix it. I did quite well. I didn't really have to dedicate myself to anything. So I didn't have any very good study habits. I did well enough that I got into my first choice uh, college or university, which was Cornell. And I was interested in doing electrical engineering there. Um, So I went and I did electrical engineering, mainly because I wanted to start the next Apple. Still want to start the next Apple. (laughs) In any case, I wanted to start the next Apple. Went and did did electrical engineering. And I chose electrical engineering also because I felt like if I did anything in humanities, I would just get A's. That's what had always happened. I wanted something that would challenge me. And I figured this would be hard because... I didn't really want to be an engineer. I wanted to follow Steve Jobs, you know, and do the business side. But I figured this would be really challenging. It would teach me about computers. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, everybody at Cornell Electrical Engineering besides me actually wanted to be an engineer. And so I was in this class all of a sudden with people who were seriously dedicated towards working at Apple or at IBM or at Google or whatever it happened to be. And I was just there sort of like, no, I just want to learn this stuff. And it's all graded on a curve, which if you don't know what that means, that means that that it's not about whether you get an A or a B. It's all about how do you do relative to everyone else? So the top person in the class, even if they get a C as a grade, they get the A and then it goes down. So I walk into Cornell and I'm like, all right, let's do this. Physics has always been a pretty good subject for me, but I walk into my physics class and my first exam, I get a C. I'm like, wait a second. Well, I don't even, I don't even count that low in the alphabet. Like, what is that? Right. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, well, we're going to have to do better. And I leave and I decide I'm going to go, I'm going to go study. And I go and I study, I walk into my next exam and I get a D. We're going the wrong direction. So at this point in time, I leave, I walk back to my, uh, my dormitory. I have a good little cry because I'm, like, I'm like, what's happening? I thought I was intelligent. Clearly I'm not. 
you know, and I call my aunt and she hears me sort of sniffling and she's just like, what's wrong with you, boy? And I said, I'm, I'm failing. And she's like, you, you haven't failed until you're dead. Have you gotten a tutor? And I was like, tutors are for people that don't know anything. She was like, go get a tutor. So, so I got a tutor and I ended up, I think, getting a C that semester in physics. I ended up overall getting a 2.98, um, which I had never seen that low a GPA. I was like, I don't really know what those numbers are. Went back the second semester, um, figured I would study some more, end up going down 2.88 GPA. The next semester, I said, all right, really got to study, but I got involved with a girl. And you know that, that took me down to 2.47. That is a C GPA overall. At this point in time, I'm like in shock. I, I thought that I was this smart, intelligent guy. Clearly, you know, clearly something had to change. So I remember going home, uh, my mother, from the Bahamas into the Bahamas. And I remember standing on the balcony, looking out at the stars and saying, okay, I'm going to change subjects, which felt to me like quitting. And we don't quit in my family. But I said, before I change the subject, I'm going to prove to myself in the world that I could actually do it. And by the way, I'm miserable the entire time. Every day I'm waking up, I'm doing this electrical engineering. And I'm just like, this is like learning that the moon is made of gas and rocks versus like cheese. So, I, um, so I'm not having fun. If I go back, I say, I'm going to do this. And I decide, I read Tony Robbins' book. I read Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. I say, okay, this is how the successful people achieve their goals. I wrote my goals down. I said, I am going to go and get a 3.8 GPA. I don't know how you go from a 2.47 to a 3.8, but I said, I'm going to get a 3.8 GPA. And I'm going to do that by dedicating myself to this, only this, and my sports, which was Taekwondo. And I'm going to achieve an A on every homework, every quiz, every test until I get that for the semester. And I dedicated myself to just that. Everything else went by the wayside. I taught myself my study habits. At the end of the semester, my last test, which was a physics test, I walked in and I got the A. And so I ended up with a 3.83 GPA in a curved, in a graded curved environment. So I was looking at everybody that's like, take that. You know, we know we can do that, right? And, <laughs> and I went on, I got a 4.0 another semester. We ended up graduating um, and doing quite well, you know, at, at Cornell in, in electrical engineering. Uh, and every day after that, I really disliked. Every day I woke up disliking electrical engineering, disliking it. Just, it was not where my soul was. By the way, I did get straight A's in every humanities class. So it was only, I was right. It was the electrical engineering that was going to challenge me. But what I learned from that was never, never, never quit. And I also learned that I can do anything, no matter how I feel on a daily basis mm. about it. And I also learned that I never want to do anything that I am not happy about doing mm. on a daily basis. Mm. I say all of that to say fast forward to the last three years of um, COVID and coming out of COVID. What happened with the business, which crushed a lot of companies in, in our space, um, as COVID happened, I saw it happening. I created a solution to end up grabbing a lot of people in the industry. And over the course of COVID, we grew eight times. When 30% of the studios in the fitness industry um, that we serve went out of business, and a lot of the tech companies either folded or dropped revenue by 90% or more. And then as we came out of COVID, we got hit with the Ukraine war. 90% of our developers are in Ukraine. So it was like existential crisis to existential crisis. We came out of this year um, or this past year, 2022, with that um, having the best year that we'd ever had, mm -hmm. despite all of that. So that early lesson mm -hmm. about what it took to just persevere through everything is what allowed us to crush it and keep going. Not just perseverance, but uh, a lot of agility to kind of, kind of move fast on your feet to switch directions and evolve right at the time during the pandemic when so much was uncertain. So I got to give you that as well. Um, I think my mother would just call it stubborn. I'm just or, stubborn. <laughs> I'm just stubborn. <laughs> I think the people that go far in life are all pretty stubborn. They're just exactly. flexible exactly. thinking. I want to ask you a question. You started yeah. out on that story saying in high school, everything had come really easy up until the point in college. T tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that. You know, what was easy? Uh, you know, I, I think I think more than anything, I was probably just I was given the benefit of 
a very involved mom, you know, as I was growing up. By the time I was three years old, I knew like the multiplication tables, right, left, side, like, like all of that. And so, um, so there was a lot of training that happened at an early age and that was enough. And then, and then I was exposed to a number of environments um, where, you know, they say that there's a huge difference in the vocabulary that you have by the time you're four or five years old in terms of comprehension and, you know, sort of correlations to how far you go in life and income and all of that. I was exposed to a lot of great people who pushed me um, really hard. My parents, uh, my family members, everyone around. And so I think that I was well set up to do, I was set up to do well in those early stages of education, you know, certainly. And, and just, you know, life, I was set up to do well. I had a lot of love and a lot of focus on the educational side. You know, when it, so you sort of hit the limits of what I would call your natural intelligence and ability to just figure stuff out, you start getting into, you know, calculus and things that just don't, you know, like you have to actually think through them. You actually have to spend the time, you know, doing the studying and figuring that out. And it's just, it's not just natural. Then you really have to learn how to work. I had to learn how to work. And I had never had to really sit down and figure out how to work before. And, and when I did, it was like, whoa, okay, got it. And, and I had actually even, I, I'd mentioned before that I, I had even, I wanted to consider myself special. And so I was like, oh, I wanted to think that I was brilliant. I wanted to think that I had, that I was a genius and stuff like that. And to me, that meant that you didn't have to work because every genius that I had ever, you know, known, didn't know many geniuses, but every genius that I that I'd ever read about, I thought they didn't have to work. And that's just a fallacy. It's yeah. not true. So then I turned around to subscribe to the Feynman, you know, thing. Like it doesn't matter what your IQ is. I think his IQ was like 120, but he's one of the greatest physicists ever, hmm. just because he worked so hard. And I have no idea what my IQ is, but um, I know that I I can outwork anyone. No, I mean, uh, I think it's so interesting when you when people maybe in their twenties or thirties kind of hit that trigger point, uh, and there hasn't been much suffering or hardship prior. And, yeah, uh, learning to build that resilience muscle, both emotionally and functionally, is it, hard to do. Uh, but but it sounds like you know in college, you know, when you're getting the C's and D's, it was one of the first times you kind of had to look at yourself in the mirror. And you mentioned you know you studied you know, Tony Robbins and. Uh, yeah. It was oh thinking grow rich Napoleon Hill yeah yeah uh, and then you changed and you walked out with an A like what what you know you read the material you changed your habits but really what changed you know what what tangible things were you doing differently you know from when you first showed up to when you finally walked out you know what happened as you walked across the bridge so two big things happened the first was a real sort of self reckoning you know I I realized that the idea of who I was or what I wanted to believe about myself was, was it was built on a false foundation, hmm. you know, and I actually needed to deconstruct absolutely everything and get down to the root, you know, of who I really was and then build, rebuild the, the bricks sort of layer by layer. So, you know, previously I'd said that this, this idea that I had had was that, you know, I was just um, smart. That was one of the core parts of what I, thought, you know, about myself. I also um, felt I was pretty athletic and there were other things as well. Um, but that smart piece was really shaken by this whole experience. And I had to come back to a place where I was like, you know, I don't know whether or not I'm that smart. What I know is that I can get any concept if I work hard enough at it. So I stopped focusing on what I was naturally, you know, sort of inclined or, or good at or anything like that, I just started focusing on the work, right? The work that was necessary in order to grasp the concept. Um, so that, that, you know, foundational restructuring was really important. And then the elimination of all distractions. You're, you're young, right? So when I say you're young, I mean, you're young when you, when you first go to college coming out of high school, and so I spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about what I would wear, you know, because I wanted to look good when I was on campus, like in the early days and all that. When I went back and I sort of broke it all down, I was like, you know, none of that matters. 
right? And so I started wearing swishies around campus all the time. I was just, I was focused on proving to myself that I was good enough, right? And all the other stuff went to the side. So yeah. I think that that's self-reckoning. Different people have that happen at different parts in their lives, um, different points in their lives. But, um, and, you know, I, I was fortunate that I had Tony and I had Napoleon Hill because I didn't have to spend thousands of dollars on expensive therapists to tell me that. I just sort of mimicked what they, what they were talking about. And I was like, okay, that, that works. You know, the book is titled Think and Grow Rich. You probably know this, but I was less focused on the grow rich part of it. And, mm. and I would encourage folks to be less focused on the grow rich part of it. What it's really about is this guy, Napoleon Hill, interviewed a whole bunch of really successful people, everyone from Einstein to the Carnegies to, you know, the Morgans, J.P. Morgan, Henry Ford. And what he was trying to do was he was trying to understand what do they do that has allowed them to be so successful. And he doesn't outright tell you what it is, but one of the key things that I took away was this idea of visualization. We hear this from Arnold Schwarzenegger as well. So visualize what you want the future to be and actually write it down, right? Write it down and put parameters around it. Here's the point in time in which I'm going to achieve and be specific you know, about that, even if you don't know how you're going to achieve it. So writing that down and then repeating it twice a day, right, in the morning and in the evening was part of the ritual uh, that he said that he had seen from a lot of very successful people. And what that does is because your mind works on it so much, it moves something from the idea of just from the idea realm to being more of an obsession, hmm. right? So I became more obsessed with figuring out this part of myself and becoming successful in that way and the rest will follow. So those are the two big things um, that really happened. I had to take a strong look at myself, break myself down and become more honest about who and where I was and what it would take to actually achieve what I wanted. Number two, a process um, that was in place that I could follow um, that started to give me that sense of momentum. No, I, I love the story. It seems like Tim Ferriss is, is the modern day version of love that. Love Tim. I know Tim. He's a good guy. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I you were in your early 20s and you took, right, learning and, and cues from... Nope, that was actually 17. Seven, 17, okay. 17. I, 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 yeah. No, I mean, I think it's such an example or testament, right? Where anytime you have the hardship in life, you, you go find the people, you go find the resources, That's right. figure out how to get to the other side. And uh, whether it's colleagues, you're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, taking a company to the next level is is part of that process. So, yeah. And T, you mentioned the the foundation uh, of coming into college. You know, you just thought you, you're naturally smart. If if I was to ask you today, if you were to say if I was to ask you, how is the foundation of your life yeah. today different of what you maybe have stood up on that foundation? What 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 is that foundation for you today versus obviously, you know, you said late teens was how smart you were and maybe what you were wearing, but today it sounds different. Yeah, no, very, very, very different. I would say that the core part of it is one of integrity, right? And that's integrity, you know, out in the world and integrity within myself. So there's a, there is, um, and I, I really, it's a legacy left to me by both sides of my family uh, that I think is, is really important. I like honesty. You know, there's, there's obviously the ways in which you're, you talk to yourself or the ways in which you talk to other people when you talk about being honest, but let's get to the root, let's get to the cause, let's get to the, the truth about um, the situation, whether it's, again, externally or internally. So that's, that's number one is I don't shy away from truth. The, I think that number two is work ethic. I focus on doing things I love, but then I also focus on the work and just continuously getting through there. There's, there is no challenge that I don't believe I can overcome if I work hard enough because I know that I am creative enough to come up mm. with the solutions for that. You know, there's a, there's, there's a formula that exists in my mind, which is if you're honest with people about what you want to do. If you're honest with yourself about what it takes to actually do it and you put in the work, then that will yield the outcome um, that you want. And I think that those are, those are the foundational pieces, mm. you know, for me, I have characteristics, I have attributes, things that I've, I've worked on that I've practiced mm. um, that make those things, uh, you know, more easy or more doable, but that's it. And underlying everything is people. 
Totally. The idea of people, the idea of community. People is the biggest, the biggest part of it. I find people to be inspirational. I find people to be, when I'm down, they bring the energy to me. But it means that you fundamentally have to treat people the right way. And so I, you know, when I look out and I look at um, uh, business mentors or, or political mentors or just people that I respect in the world, uh, what they have, I, I've never cared how successful you are if you're a jerk. The people that I look at are people who have figured out how to be immensely successful in their field while also being human hmm. about it. And so I strive to do that every day. That's how I'd want to be treated. And that's how, you know, I think the world should be and the world would be a better place if, if more people did that. I think there's an energetic, you know, ripple effect there as well. And if you're treating your employees the right way, your family the right way, and they have good experience. Absolutely. That's going to be passed down to their future actions after, which everyone benefits from. Exactly. We should all pay it forward, right? We should all pay it forward. Like we all, we got here, we all got here because we stood on the shoulders of other people, right? And I, I you know, I was born with this idea that he to whom much is given, much is expected. I was given a lot of love. I was given, um, I was given to believe that I could be anything I put my mind to, which is not something that we give to like a lot of kids, a lot of people don't grow up with that understanding. But if you do manage to do something, anything, you know, that is, um, that is helpful, pay that forward, you know, yeah. give it to the folks. Once you graduated from Cornell, once you, how are you thinking about life? What was your view on life and what you were going to go do then? I mean, your aspirations are very lofty today. I know, you know they'll never stop, but were you, were you thinking that big at graduation? I, I asked my, my mother the question in the middle of college. I was like, why am I even here? You know, I, I, I want to start a company, right? Bill Gates dropped out of college. Like, why can't I do that? And, and she quickly set me straight on that path. She was like, go and, go and make sure you have your backup plan, right? So, <laughs> but, but absolutely, I, I, I've always had aspirations that were big. There, there are so many things that that I aspire to do when I look around at the world, and I'll give an example um, in a second, but that require you to make big changes. You don't get to big changes by thinking small. So for example, one of the things that really affected me, you know, growing up and that I did not like was what I'll call the isms, racism, sexism, religionism, all, all the rest of that, religion is not a word, whatever. We get the idea. Discrimination um, in any form is something that really bothers me. And it's something that affected me as I was growing up. It was something that I wanted to make a difference on. Well, you can't sit there and say, I'm going to make a difference in how discrimination happens without thinking big, thinking really big. I'm going to be tackling something that is just endemic to a large part of this, this world. And so, and so my, my dreams, uh, my ambitions have always been big. You talked a lot about that moment of hard work and resilience yeah. and yeah. Uh, learning now you've gone on to to build a, a company now uh, and building a company. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the impetus for how it how it got started. I guess at this point I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, my first company does educational video games. You know, think Halo minus the violence, if you can imagine such a thing. But letting kids play against each other while they learn different subjects. The second the second company, which is called FitGrid. You know, my there are themes in what I do in life, and I, my themes. I say that I like to optimize humanity. So my educational video game business was about getting kids excited about learning, you know, so that they could then have opportunities that they might not have been born into this. That came as a result of, you know, growing up in Nigeria and you go out on the streets and you see kids that have nothing. And you're just like, wow, the only thing that I really did was I won the birth lottery, you know? So how do I, how do I give this opportunity to these kids? Let's get them excited about learning through something, through a medium that, that kids like to play. The, the fitness technology business that I've started, which is FitGrid and that I'm doing now, is about helping, helping people lead healthier, happier lives, ultimately. And so I, I measure impact and influence by the number of people that we affect. You know, I, caught, I got into that actually because I had my own um, challenge. I ended up with something called plantar fasciitis after I had stepped out of my first company. You get it if you do a lot of running, if you do a lot of exercising uh, without stretching. Apparently, once you get over the age of 30, you really need to stretch. 
hit everyone out there, right? So, so I, I hadn't stretched. I and so my calves were tight and everything. So the the, the tendons between the front and back of my feet were so tight at this point in time that I couldn't stand for more than 15 minutes, which was really, really challenging. Uh, I went into the doctor. Um, the doctor sent me to the therapist. And the therapist was like, oh, you have plantar fasciitis. And I was like, wow, what do I do about that? And, um, and they said, well, uh, you're gonna, we're going to grind your feet out, <laughs> which was really painful. You're going to roll on this golf ball, but you should also do group fitness, do a little yoga to lengthen the muscles, Pilates to strengthen the core. And I was like, that sounds great. What the hell is Pilates? <laughs> I had no idea, right? So, so I, you know, I tried the yoga, um, but I, I apparently didn't get introduced to vinyasa yoga, which really, you know, you sweat a lot in vinyasa. I think I was the more gentle, kinder yogas. And I was like, this isn't for me. I need to sweat, feel like I'm sweating. So I tried the Pilates and that's like doing sit-ups for like an hour. And I was like, okay, this, this is something that, you know, I feel like, feel like I should do. So I, I did the Pilates. Um, and you know, I ended up getting a private instructor and we would do the Pilates uh, twice a week in my apartment after about three months, it cleaned up everything. And I was able to stand for more than 15 minutes. I was like, this is my next business, mm. this area, because along the way I had discovered that instructors really, they don't know how to build, uh, businesses, um, you know, on their own. So they're trying to build these individual businesses, but also I was invited into um, a group fitness class. Hmm. And I went into this group fitness class. Um, she, she invited me to come to class. Initially, I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. And I was like, why would I do that? She's like, well, you might like being around other people. And I was like, okay, when is it? And she was like, uh, Sunday. I was like, no, 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 I'm not going anywhere on a Sunday. I was like, what time? She was like, 9 a.m. I was like, 9 a.m. on a Sunday? No way. I was like, where is it? She was like, Soho. I lived around half an hour from Soho. I was like, you want me to get up for a Sunday 9 a.m. class? in Soho, like half an hour away. I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. I was there the next week, right? Because wow, we follow our instructors or our teachers. And so all of a sudden I was seeing this parallel between the education sector I'd been in, mm -hmm. where the teachers, you know, were such a key part of implementing this educational video game solution. And all of a sudden I'm following my teacher to this class. I walk into this class. I'm the only guy in class. Nothing wrong with being the only guy in class, except you can be very uncomfortable. And I was very uncomfortable because I was just like, okay, I've been to Stairmaster classes before where after like two minutes, I'm on the ground dying and everyone else is continuing because I just don't use those muscles. So I was like, this is going to be another embarrassing moment in NT's life, right? So I go in, I put my mat down next to these three ladies and they're talking to each other and they're saying, hey, are we doing brunch after Pilates? I was like, I like brunch. You know, so, so I'm like, hey, ladies, you know, what are we doing? Where are we going? Like, I'm trying to be like friendly and trying to get to know people in the class. And of course, I was not invited to brunch. Right. And so that was actually like the inspiration for my idea. If you believe the social network, the movie, The Social Network, Zuck started Facebook because he didn't have, you know, any friends. And, you know, I started this because I was invited to brunch. Right. But what I learned was, <laughs> my God, this is this is uh, this is a community. These are communities. And it was the strangest community though, because three months later, I still didn't know 70% of the people in the community. Mm. And I was like, this is really strange because this is a studio, it's a gym type business. And I was like, I am, as a person, I am far more likely to come back to these classes, the more connected I am to the other people. So whether it is the other clients in class, whether it's the instructor who's motivating me to run through a wall or whether it's the front desk person who just says, Hey, NT, good to see you again. That's what I'm more likely to do. And so I, I developed this thesis that fitness is all about the people, right? It's all about the people that you're connected to. I started to look at that and say, why, why hasn't anyone created software to help these businesses do that? Because if I come back more often, I'm also more likely to invite new people. So this is a business solution and uh, no one had done it. So we decided to do it. And that's how Fit Freak got started. By not getting invited to brunch. Not, not getting invited to brunch. That's right. But something you said was you started going to this class and you didn't know 70% of the people in the class. That's right. Why not? Like what, what was hindering that from happening? I'm a pretty outgoing person. A lot of people are not. In fact, in the industry, uh, 
you can have up to a 50% attrition rate after the first class. People come into things like even yoga that I think is pretty, uh, I think is pretty simple, but a lot of people are intimidated by that. You know, they go in, they see all the poses, the poses are hard. Everyone else seems to know it. Um, that was not my challenge, but that's the challenge of a lot of people is that they're very self-conscious. My challenge was that, you know, this would, they call this group fitness, but in many cases, you're sort of just an individual in a group class going up and talking to someone, you know, if you don't just bump into them in the locker room can be pretty challenging. Right. And so I think that we sometimes have our inhibitions that keep us from doing it because it's a class and everyone can see you if you go up and you start talking to someone. For me specifically, I was the only guy in class. And it just felt like if I talked to anyone, everyone else would think that I was trying to hit on them. And I was like, I, I, I can't talk to anyone. Like, this is ridiculous. So, <laughs> so I, it felt uncomfortable for that, mm. just for that reason. And it took time to break that down. I mean, community is, I mean, clearly, as we both know, I think community is, is one of the most powerful drivers of human connection. It, it, Absolutely. Let's get to know ourselves. But, but I think there's something deeper here, like to actually build a good community, one that's aligned, healthy, in tune with who you are. I think that it takes a level of just, let's just call it self-awareness, introspection, because to, to really line up to the people around you in a way that's meaningful. How do you think about the community? How do you think about building community for you? Pilates, gym aside, I mean, just community as NT as you move through the world. What's that look like, feel like? First, it starts with authenticity. Whatever community someone chooses to be a part of, it's because they identify something in the community that matches with something in themselves. People go to communities because they're seeking acceptance. They're trying to reduce loneliness. They're trying to feel as if they are, they are part of a group that has similar ideas, motivations, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, <clears throat> so for the people who create communities, it has to start with something that has what I call their internal energy hmm. infused into it. And that requires pure authenticity. So for me, um, any community that I create is going to be a community that is, that is steeped in integrity, is going to be a community that is dedicated to working hard, to innovation, to moving quickly, to um, and to being human. I've turned down communities before. Like, for example, when I was in college, I got a bid from a fraternity, you know, they actually sent guys over to my room, you know, and, and, and I said, guys, I, I've got to turn this down. I'm, I'm deeply flattered, but I'm turning it down. They were like, why? And I said, well, because I, I kind of don't want to be in a community where I feel like I'm forced to like someone who I might not like. So this, is, this has been something that's been with me for a long time. And so I was like, well, I'll just go and create my own communities. There's communities mm -hmm. I'm a part of, but I will just create my own communities. So that has been my own companies, my own organizations, where I can be very, very comfortable that the things that I believe in are what we can enforce or otherwise support. No, I, I mean, that's powerful. And I think if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying I've had to show up in the world as my unique self and, and, and echo and showcase the things that I believe in. In turn, that's going to build communities that's going to rally people around with shared that's beliefs. Right. That's right. We are better together. Um, we seek the, the beauty and the opportunity and the, and the potential, you know, yeah. in, in every person. And we celebrate that. Yeah. Not in a kumbaya way, but in a very real, like, everyone has value if you can find it. I think there's so many people who stand on the fringe, have the foot in uh, on the fringe of a community, even though it's not fully themselves and, and yeah. they uh because they don't know how right to celebrate their own unique beauty which which you know you have done time after time right it takes a lot of courage to i think stand freely and, and build community around what you believe is you so you know one of the challenges is that we are social creatures you know one of the challenges that we have is that if community is another word for group there are a lot of groups right now in the yeah. world that people feel pressured to be a part of, but that don't fully represent, you know, who they are. I, I'm looking for the ways to help people create this space, the communities or the groups um, mm -hmm. that represent what they believe in, yeah. you know, which I think is important. How, how have you gone about building uh, the software and technology to include community and make people feel part of something 
aligned to them, you know, and, and how is the way you've built the company and in the app, I mean, software kind of come to life through your vision and your beliefs? First of all, and I think that this applies, um, you know, what we've done from a philosophical level applies to industries beyond fitness. This is just where, where it started and where I, I saw it. But if you look at a studio, I am distinguishing a studio from a gym, right? In a studio, I'm talking more CrossFit, boot camp, yoga, uh, bar, Pilates. So these tend to be uh, smaller locations or facilities that focus on a, a single activity. Sometimes it can be uh, multiple activities, but generally a single activity, um, as opposed to a gym where you could go in and you, you could have the treadmill, the basketball court, the swimming pool, you, like you could do a whole bunch of different things. In the studio communities, there tend to be three groups. There is the group that's management. So your staff, uh, your owner, your managers, um, you have your instructors or your teachers or your trainers, and then you have the clients. The way that I have thought about community, and again, this is applicable across different communities um, as well, is that in order to really connect people, you need to have a tool that sits in the hands of each group. In this case, uh, the studio, the people that are the management need to be able to see who's in the community and have enough data and information about them. They can have useful and unique conversations with them. And, and when I say unique, I mean like personal to them, hmm. right? Which is really hard to get if you're running a business and a thousand people stream through your studio, you know, every month, getting to know them is really difficult. Uh, the instructors, the instructors are there to teach the class, but the instructors are also <clears throat> the person, excuse me, um, the person that the clients end up interacting with the most. They're, they're sort of the micro influencer for the studio. Um, so give them some way to connect a little more deeply, understand a little bit more about, you know, the people around them. And then finally the clients themselves, um, need to have something where they can connect with each other underneath all of that you get to this idea of data and information uh, and personalization about the individuals. You cannot build community without actually paying attention to people. And when you're, when you're moving through something, you're moving through a business, you're moving through a class or whatever, really, really rapidly, that information needs to be at your fingertips so that you can make a connection immediately. This is why I didn't know 70% of the people in my studio after three months. Whereas, you know, there's a consumer side, like a, a client side app um, that we developed, which allows you to see what the similarities are that you have with other folks, information that they put in. So if I saw someone else that had an interest in golfing or cameras or something, I can now go up to that person. I can be like, oh, you have an interest in cameras? I do also. That's the icebreaker that allows you to start to have the conversation, mm. especially with people that you're in class with or you're actually seeing. And a similar sort of thing on the instructor and on the on the manager um, side. So it starts with being able, getting people into a place where they are comfortable sharing information. Once they share the information, giving it to them at a time and in a way that they can easily integrate that into a conversation or an interview. No, I absolutely love that. And just to well, uh, anecdote with a question, I ran a global community for the brightest young entrepreneurs around the world back in 2016. And when they all came in, it's like you build the trust, as you said, but then you get data points on them, you know, location, yeah. interest, technology, you know, I didn't have software, I was the manual software, but it was about connecting them, right? And yep. like, and it was beautiful. So, so with that, right, you've now created the technology to enable that to happen, you know, across gyms and, and, and mm -hmm. the fitness industry at large. So you've had how many, how many thousands of members? I'm, I'm going to turn this to a question, but I, I, yeah. how many thousands of members on the platform? Call about 5 million. Five million, okay. five million people in our database. Oh, excuse me. I, I should know this. Um, it is now. It's all good. Okay. <laughs> Five well, tell me this. You've enabled community at scale. If anything stands out, I mean, I'd love to know any stories of the way the platforms brought people together. Uh, they just speak to you or uh, I'm just curious how what yeah. you've created uh, has enabled this community. So yeah, any, any poignant stories that stand out would be awesome to hear. I'll give sort of the, the general... Uh, the general feedback is we look at this in terms of like the features that we build into the system. What we've gotten a tremendous amount of feedback on has been the ease with which people know when their friends sign up for class. You know, I call, I call fitness the new coffee. I live my life and I set my schedule 
And sometimes it's really hard to just meet up with friends. Mm -hmm. right, so one of the features that we hear a lot about uh, from folks that they really, really love is if you connect with each other inside the app, knowing when your friend signs up mm -hmm. for class, right? Because then of course you can go, um, you can go choose and you can go and take that class. That is something that we've heard um, a lot about. And then, and then the other part of it is just, uh, I call it the, the voyeur, <laughs> you know, aspect. When you sign up for the class, before you sign up for a class, you do not see who is in the class. But when you sign up, you actually then see who's in the class. And people just go to look at who's in class because they're just like curious. You know, and I, I don't know if that's exactly the definition of what a voyeur is. But anyway, these are people that like, I am curious about who's coming into class. There's a curiosity uh, that people have about who's going to be there because that's motivating to them. Hmm. You know, that's the person that I remember that was doing the, the sports. They were doing it really, really well. That's motivating to me. Or, you know, on the other hand, that's the person who was really interested. I'd really like to meet that person. So once you sign up for the class and it opens up and you can actually see who's in it, you know, folks have said that's been really great. It's actually facilitated a lot of introductions for me because I felt like I, I had the chance to prepare my opening you know, to this, um, to this person. And also because I saw the things that they were interested in. It is hard to fit in friends, uh, yeah. especially if you're passionate about what you're doing and then yeah. it's time for people you love and care about, but to have that enabled to share shared interests and values, um, speaks volumes. And, Absolutely. and I'm sure, you know, the, the, what's so interesting is this, it's really hard to, to measure the ripple effect of what you've created. But uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you, people have gotten married off the platform and all that. Maybe not. Um, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to put that stat up because I think there was, was it back in the day, eHarmonyOrMatch.com or something like that once said, we, are rep we represent like 5% of people on our platform have gotten married to each other. I haven't heard that story yet, you know, but I'm waiting yeah. for that. Hey, hey I, it, it's got to be close to happening. That's right. Know? That's right. I mean, look, the bigger vision, you know, for FitGrid is not, just about enabling these communities within studios and gyms, but actually enabling community in anything that you do in fitness and in health. So we want to sit at the center of your lifestyle and say, oh, you're looking for a studio or a gym to go to. Great. You can use this. You're looking for a private instructor. You're looking for a virtual experience, or you're looking to just um, coordinate your game of tennis or golf or your walk around the park with your friends. You can do that. And then because we understand this, um, information like you went jogging five, five days a week. Well, now we want to partner with like Nike or whatever to say, hey, there's a running shoe for you, right? So we want to enable the products and services that allow you to become the best and healthiest version of yourself. So at the end of the day, we really want to sit at the center of not just your fitness, but your fitness and health lifestyle. And the way that I think about that is that, you know, my mother's a doctor. Medicine is an emergency thing. I go to the doctor when I have a problem. So many of us don't just do like regular checkups, but I go and I have a problem. Well, long before I have a problem, I'm doing all of this other informal stuff that has to do with like my fitness and my health and all that. And no one's mapping that. Mm. We think about mapping that. Mm. Who are the connections? Who are the people? What are the lines of influence? That's what we're actually mapping. What are the lines of influence that happen as you go along the path of life so that when you walk into the doctor, there's actually a better understanding of what you have been doing and who has been influencing you. We once drew a network map of the number of people inside of a class that had seen each other three or more times. I mean, it was like, it was like a dark circle. You're like, oh my God, that many people have seen it. And I'm like, yes, and each one of those lines, that's a line of influence. This person can influence this other person to go to the gym more. Hmm. or they can influence them on what they did to cure their plantar fasciitis or, you know, what shoes they're wearing or whatever. Those are all lines of influence hmm. that we are mapping. Hmm. We can send any information down around. Now, hopefully that information is good um, for people, which is, you know, again, about integrity and honesty. That's where I come from. Um, but that's, that's the mapping that we're doing. Super powerful stuff. I mean, if it, I mean, for that, just in the simplest form, your Pilates teacher, she never walked in or he never walked into your life. That line of influence now has created millions exactly. lines of influence. Exactly. So, 
What's the future look like for you? Dream out with us five, 10 years. Sounds like community might be at the center of everything you do, but what are you, what are you kind of baking up inside, whatever you're willing to share, you know, even if it's 20 years out, but I'm just curious what's burning. You know, I go back to, you know, the idea that he to whom much is given, much is expected. And what I want to give back to the world is um, better confidence Mm. in themselves, like in each person within themselves and better tolerance, Mm. you know, for the other people um, that exist in the world. Like if at the end of my days, I can say a billion more people are more tolerant of each other and feel more confident in themselves to go out and have the impact on the world that they want to have, then I'll be happy. Now there are a number of, um, there are a number of ways in which I I plan to do that. But one of the first ways, like right now, you know, I'm sort of on the capitalist path, right? Um, And baked into the sort of capitalist path is this idea that I want to have impact on a certain number of people. But in addition to that, I also want there to be a certain economic value, you know, that exists both, uh, both within the companies that are started themselves, but also so that I have the freedom to then go and apply money, dollars, towards these things that I think are important. You know, if you look at the levers that sort of shift the world, it's really remarkable what happens if you can walk in, it doesn't matter whether it's your money or whether it's someone else's, but you can walk into an organization, a country, a group, whatever it happens to be and say, hey, I think that this is a really powerful idea. I would like to apply $10 million towards, you know, doing that and supporting this cause, right? So, so writ large in the phase right now where I'm saying that the, the economic aspect of let's make the companies very successful or the foundations that I'm involved with that I start um, very successful and able to generate you know, profits on their own so they can reinvest in doing those ideas. That's what I'm very focused on right now. As I look five, 10 years from now, you know, that, that exists, then, you know, the idea of stepping out and creating the foundations, mm-hmm. right? I, I, I like the Bill and Melinda Gates, you know, foundation, like the way that they have gone about um, doing that around the things that I'm interested in and that I'm focused on. I have some of those ideas already there, but it's sort of like, there's a stage, there's a stage, there's broader impact, and then there's how you represent yourself and how you have fun along the way. So that doesn't, that isn't specific, but that's how I see. Great. Well, I, I, I think it's a beautiful description. I can't wait to read the book in 20 years on how you do it all. <laughs> and T, this has been a, a joy. Uh, thank you for your time. Where can people find you, reach out, all the things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, people should always feel free to send me an email at nt at fitgrid.com. That's F-I-T-G-R-I-D um, as in dog, um, dot com. So fit, nt at fitgrid.com. Uh, you can also look me up on LinkedIn. That's nt at Starting to share my thoughts there, you know, on LinkedIn. Um, always hit me up and ping me back. Great. Yeah, I've been, I've been enjoying what you've been writing. So thanks so much. And we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for joining me on The One Away Show. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, please leave a review and follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Have a one-away moment you'd like to share? Follow me on Twitter or Instagram at BrianWish underscore. Or reach out to me on LinkedIn and tell me about the moment that altered your life. The One Away Show is produced by ArcBound a company dedicated to helping entrepreneurs, experts, and visionaries launch authentic personal brands. From message development to podcast production, social media content generation, and book writing, we work with you to create your arc. Head to arcbound.com to learn more. Thank you for listening, and please join me next time on The One Away Show.